Rolling, you're on. Hey, what's going on, guys? Vinny Hardy here from CreationsRomingOut.com and Creationist Company, here with my brother Joe. Hey, everyone, welcome to the Creationist Roming Now podcast where astronomy and the Bible go together like me and stupid puns. Yeah, and for some reason today, Joey is taller than me. It's because I'm not. Which, she's sitting on a chair, it's a stepladder. But for me, actually, I do not like it when people are taller than me. Like, whenever somebody tall goes by, I will stand on my tippy toes to avoid feeling degraded. But today, we are very likely to be degraded because we are interviewing one of my all-time idols here. Uh, you see, uh, we were coming to the Christian Museum. That's where we are right now. We're in their observatory, amazing place. I have never seen it before. But then, who should we meet up with? We wanted to go see Mark Loy, see if we could interview Danny Faulkner. I didn't, I, you know, I really didn't think we'd be able to, you know. Busy people, busy times. But uh, you know, we actually he met us and he said, "Could you do it today?" Like, oh, I gotta write my notes. <laughs> so I wrote my notes, and I have some notes, and we're gonna try to shoot from the hip. The only problem is we're not good at doing that. So prepare for a rerun of the homeschool convention episode. Anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> that sounds scary. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Doctor Faulkner. Um, first of all, actually. One of the books which actually got me when I started learning about astronomy, it was one of the books I learned. See, it was awesome because when I started astronomy, three things pushed me along. One, one, there's this book that we had for a long time that I'd read before. I read it again. It's called Astronomy by Design. Universe by Design. Yeah, that's your book, but there's a, some other guy's book. Oh, that was the first thing. I don't remember. Jonathan something. Or Jonathan right. Henry, uh, the astronomy book. What he said. <laughs> This book is what got me started in astronomy. In a way, this book is what brought creation astronomy now into the world. This book right here. So uh, anyway, that was the first thing. The next thing was that right after, I mean right after I got into astronomy, Answers in Genesis released the astronomy version of their Answers magazine, which was just, I don't believe in coincidence. And the third thing was that we went to the Christian Museum again. I got to see a whole bunch of astronomy-related stuff. And I got the book that I do not have right now because it's locked in my backpack in the van. But that book was Universe by Design by Dr. Danny Faulkner. Could I get it signed? Sure. If I can get out of the van. Get out of your van, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, I would like to give a little bio about him, but I didn't have time to go over the bio because I was rushed. So we're going to let you do that. So okay. tell us about yourself. Well, I have a PhD in astronomy. I got it from Indiana University. And for many years, I was on the faculty at the University of South Carolina, Lancaster. And uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, end of 2012, I took an early retirement so I could come work at the Creation Museum and Answers in Genesis. So I've been here since January of 2013. So you're the staff astronomer. I'm the staff astronomer, and they want to have somebody in different fields like geology, biology, astronomy, because whenever a news item comes up that we need to respond to or to talk about, or if there's a question that comes in, they want somebody with the credentials to, to address those. Got it. So uh, now, 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 you're, now I've, seen you, I've seen you speak before, I believe, I don't believe I've, I've been, I previewed one of your DVDs. I actually bought several DVDs today. Um, there's still one more I'd like to get, but uh, I can't afford it right now. He's but, running out of money. Yeah. But okay, we get three DVDs when we renew the answer to subscription. So okay. I get more. You get more? But uh, anyway, now one of the recent places I saw, I've been watching several episodes of Creation 21st Century, because the way it works, on Wednesday every day, every Wednesday at 11 o'clock, for a while there, I went on the computer, I wanted to watch it. So I'd sit there and they go, bleh, bleh. It was, this computer is so slow and the internet buffer, is buffer, so... Buffer. Yeah. So I said, I'm going to have to let the episodes load after they're released. So I did that and so I get to watch, so, so because of that, I see my excuse, I can watch this one and this one and this one. And so I spent hours watching Creation 21st Century. But hey, it beats watching television. But uh, anyway, I've seen you on several episodes of Creation 21st Century, and that is why some of these issues. First of all, um, you kind of had a, in the episode about time, what, time, what was the episode title? 
Starlight Time? Starlight and Time, which at first I was like, I wonder if he's going to mention time travel. <laughs> <laughs> which actually I'm working on a Vincent. Sorry to dis disappoint you. <laughs> actually I'm working on a Vincent video about time travel. We'll alert you about it in some other episode because we're going to be recording several episodes real quick so that we can tell you guys all about our adventure at the Creation Museum, but for now, we do that I am not us. So, uh, but first of all, the distant starlight theory, could you tell us, just first give us the uh, basis of how the theory works? Uh, my theory? Yeah. I should describe the problem first. We call this the uh, uh, distant starlight problem. Uh, we, we think that the world is, the uh, universe is probably billions of years in uh, light years across. And that would, uh, we know of galaxies that appear to be millions and billions of light years away. And presumably if light takes uh, that millions or billions of years to get here, uh, then how can we see those if the universe is only thousands of years old as we believe from the Bible? Well, uh, there are several solutions out there. I've offered my own in the past year and a half. The um, thing is, I, I think the problem is not properly formulated many times because uh, instead of looking at it at the end of creation, here we are 6,000 or so years after creation, let's go back to the creation week. God makes Adam and Eve, he made it the stars on day four, makes Adam and Eve on day six. At the end, sunset at the end of day six, the beginning of day seven, they look up in the sky, what do they see? Well, I think they see pretty much what we see today, all these stars up there. And you see the nearest star outside of the sun is over four light years away. So you have to get light here in two days, <laughs> forget thousands of years. So the problem is far worse than people think. It's not just the billions of light years away is a problem, it's the nearby stars is a problem. And as I said, there are several solutions. My solution, I don't have time to talk about it in full depth here, but um, I think uh, basically what happened is God made the stars on day four out of material that he created on day one. And uh, in order for them to fulfill their functions, the light had to get here very quickly. And you look back at the day three account, it talks about plants uh, uh, forming, and it says that uh, God said, let the earth bring forth, it mentions three types of plants, and the next verse, verse 12 says, and the earth brought forth all those plants. And I read that many times, bring forth, brought forth in verses 11 and 12, and I thought it was the same word each time, same Hebrew verb. It's a, it's a different verb, very different. And um, what, when, when I thought about that, I thought, what's going on in day three? It doesn't say, poof, God just created these things or they just appeared suddenly. This bringing forth sounds like these plants kind of grew up out of the ground very quickly. And if you look up the words used in verses 11 and 12, those verbs in Hebrew, it's exactly what it, it seems to suggest. Bring forth isn't bad, sprout, or or produce, but also thrust and shoot are possible meanings. So I think what happened on day three is God miraculously brought these plants up to maturity very quickly. They weren't made mature, they matured rapidly though. So this is kind of like a, a maturing model, I guess you could call it. So I think on day three, uh, day three God rapidly grew the plant, something like a time-lapse movie of how a plant may develop over time. and. Um, Maybe on day four, God did the same thing. He created the, the, the stars, but he brought, the, brought forth the light very quickly, matured it, as it were. Natural uh, going of, on of, of, of uh, events, but in a very fast manner, just like this rapid growth took place on day three. And so I think that's what he did on, on day four, and I think that it, um, the stretching of the heavens mentioned in some of the poetic and prophetic books in the Old Testament may, may tie into this. I don't know yet. But um, I, I call it the Dasha solution because one of the two words used in verses 11 and 12 of Genesis 1, uh, the verb is Dasha. So I thought that was a neat, neat one to use. By the way, guys, if you want an in-depth thing, you should definitely check out Creation in the 21st Century. David Reeves has done a fantastic job on this show. So yeah. Now, you know, it's kind of funny. I, th I was thinking, you know, it's like, you know, going back, you know, it kind of makes sense. Because, like, Adam and Eve, when they were first created, did they have hair? Yeah, because I mean, they probably should. I hope well, well, you keep, keep in mind. Keep in mind that, that God used a process for Adam and Eve. He, when he made Adam, he shaped his body out of the out of the dirt of the ground. It wasn't just poof. There he was. It, I, I can almost picture this dirt being brought together and assembled. Took a took a moment or two, maybe. But there was a process. It wasn't poof like that. I don't think from what the description is. And same same for Eve. He put a deep sleep on Adam, and he took part of the side of Adam, and he formed woman out. It wasn't like, poof, this woman appeared. It took something that existed and shaped and formed it and to make woman. So the same, again and again in the creation week, you see a process but very rapid, very miraculous taking place. Of course, that's just a theory. A creation theory. theory. We should make our own show. Think of creation theory, it's like, it's, I've heard it before. It's like, it's kind of interesting to think about, you know, what was God doing 
before creation. It could be that he's creating the matter, because at, because you know then he used the matter and that to create the the world. But anyway, uh, recently one of the DVDs we picked up, which I would like, but in the future, as soon as I get a chance to watch it, I'm going to post a review on creationtrainingnow.com. But um, it's called the things that things that go bump in the night. <laughs> it's about uh, dark matter and black holes, which really is especially dark matter, is a topic that I really lack understanding and I'm looking forward to it. But could you give us like a, a with a no spoiler version so that people say, I gotta check out the DVD so we can yeah. support Genesis and Genesis. Yeah, I talk about dark matter, dark energy, and a little bit about, uh, excuse me, dark matter, black holes, and a little bit about dark energy. But I spend most of my time on black holes probably. Uh, I find that some creationists are very suspicious of black holes because they think that somehow uh, uh, scientists, astronomers have made up uh, black holes to salvage their evolutionary theories. That's not true at all. Actually, there's a very good, strong evidence going back almost a half century now uh, where we can see evidence of black holes. We can't see the black holes themselves, but we can see the effect of gravity of the black holes have a material around things spiraling down into them. We can see that as they emit light from that. And there's a pretty strong case to make that uh, black holes exist, or stellar black holes, or supermassive black holes at the center of large galaxies, such as our own Milky Way galaxy. And then dark, um, dark matter has been talked about for 80 years, going back in the 1930s. It wasn't taken seriously until about 30 years ago. But it appears, a good, again, a long, uh, long line of evidence that suggests that uh, perhaps 90% of the matter in the universe is invisible. And if, it, if it's real, and I think that it is, then it's a form of matter we don't even know about yet. We've eliminated everything that it could be that we know about. So it tells me that we only know about 10% of the matter in the universe. It is something beyond that, that is unknown yet. I, I people ask me what it is, I say I have a very good answer for that. I don't know. Uh, nobody does. But if, you, if you, uh, you're able to definitively answer the question what dark matter is, you'll get a Nobel Prize in physics probably. It's that big of a question. Dark energy, well, I'm not so sure about that. I, I think it's pretty model dependent, but I'm pretty bullish on black holes and dark, dark matter. You know, what do you think of that, guys? Media. That way I don't get in trouble. I get in trouble. I actually got in trouble because I was doing parkour in the creation museum parking lot. So be careful, guys. Don't go jumping around on walls and stuff. Because I can get you in trouble with the get in GPS, yep. Yeah. But I am surrounded by some of the coolest stuff. For an astronomer, Telescopes are really neat. So, could you tell us about this observatory and some of the telescopes we're looking at? Yeah, we've just got now? three of them here. We've got our, well, we have two 16-inch telescopes. The one right here behind you, that's a 16-inch uh, Newtonian reflector. That means there's a, there's a mirror uh, 16 inches in diameter down inside of that, which collects the light and forms the image up near the top. Uh, this is uh, permanently mounted, as you can see, inside of our observatory. We've got part of the roof rolled back, but when we use it, we roll the whole roof off the building. We have another 16-inch, uh, not in the camera view right now, but it's down for maintenance and upgrades right now. My favorite telescope is this one right here. It's a 5-inch refractor. I love refractors. They give really sharp, clear images of the moon and the planets. And when we do our um, stargazers here at the observatory, we generally use this, uh, this one to look at the planets. And then our most recent acquisition is the Quest Star. It's only a 3.5-inch size. It's got a mirror only 3.5 inches across. Don't let the small size fool you. It's a uh, very powerful telescope. We usually use it for the moon here at the uh, museum, but actually we got it to travel. This telescope from here on up fits in a tidy little box about yay big that you can carry on an airplane and put in the overhead bin. Last time I flew with it, the TSA people thought it was a blender. <laughs> they thought it was going to make margaritas in the middle of the flight, I guess. I don't know. But uh, anyway, uh, it's a very nice telescope. We use it on our Grand Canyon raft trip, astronomy, uh, excuse me, geology by day, astronomy by night, but we also take it on the road and we use it here for our open nights and also our daytime program looking at the sun here at the museum. And this telescope right here proves that bigger is not always better. Absolutely. In fact, these two telescopes, my two favorites, are the smallest ones we have. All the other telescopes we have are bigger. And, but uh, they, it's like any kind of tool. Uh, you, you shouldn't be using a, a wrench as a hammer. I've done it a few times, but it's not really good. You should get a hammer for a hammer, <laughs> a wrench for a wrench. Telescopes are the same way. Depending on what you want to look at, you get this particular telescope out or that particular telescope. There's no uh, one-size-fits-all sort of thing. So that means that just because Joey's small, even though he's hugging right now... He's kind of young, but he'll, he'll grow up. These telescopes have reached their maximum size. Okay. So, uh... Which, what if I get a pro athlete? 
<laughs> what do you think, Kelly? Not I don't know. You've been kind of quiet. Are you take? Are you getting all this? Danny Faulkner kind of loses me. I'm trying to catch up with him. <laughs> I get lost I a lot myself. I think I understand so what he's saying. I think. I get lost a lot myself, so it rubs <laughs> off on you, obviously. It's like I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm kind of worried because, you know, I get into more complex topics. And I'm like, how much longer am I gonna understand this? But I'll if I just go back two weeks. I say, oh, what I learned two weeks ago, it all makes sense now. So, just if I just keep it up, I can master these complex topics until I'm up here with this guy. One day. Well, uh, you know, um, um, I'm saying um again. No matter. So, before I believe we've taken about, I don't know how many minutes we've taken, but uh, we're not going to take too many more. So, do you have anything, well actually, how can people come to see this observatory themselves? Well, we have a um, uh, open nights. We do public nights. We do uh, usually April to October. We have um, what are called stargazers. You can go on the Creation Museum website and creationmuseum.org. I think is the name of the site. I know you can get there from AnswersInGenesis.org. Okay, and uh, we have the schedule published there. It's um, usually on the weekends of the first quarter moon, or close to the first quarter moon. We don't do it outside of October to April because for some reason people don't want to go out and spend a couple hours in, at night outside in January. I don't know why. But, uh, can imagine. <laughs> we also, if you have a group and want to come, um, we, can, we can arrange that to special showings. Uh, and uh, also we have our uh, sunspotting program we do, particularly in the summertime uh, during, the, during the week at various times. That's on the schedule normally well as well. That can be canceled. Yeah. For instance, tomorrow we're supposed to do it, but I don't know what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. Yeah. But we, there we use the uh, crust star to uh, look at sunspots in the sun. There was a nice spot yesterday. And uh, then we use the uh, special filter on the, uh, the uh, refractor there to uh, look at prominences on the sun. These are these loops of gas that uh, seem to extend out of the end of space. They're really pretty. Really so uh, if there are any clouds at all, you can't look at the sun, but you know, like you know, it's partially cloudy. But yeah, when it's cloudy like this, uh, you, you, between the clouds you can look at it, but it really is not good on a cloudy, a cloudy cloudy day you can't do it. And by the way, I should emphasize, do not attempt this at home. <laughs> Looking at the sun can be very dangerous. We have very special filters here at the Creation Museum that we can put on and we are perfectly safe to look at the sun. But if you don't know what you're doing, you really ought not to try. Speaking of which, when I first got my telescope, it has this thing on the back. Do not look at the sun. Yeah. Do I scribble that? Look at not. <laughs> okay. Do first look at the first sun. thing it is, you look at the sun, right? <laughs> <laughs> well anyway, um you got now definitely guys, check out the Creation Museum. This is our first day here. I can't wait for the second day, but we haven't finished the first day yet, so whatever. The point is it's Great. This is my third time here. Um, I'm not tired of it yet. So, I think you'll like it too. And uh, actually, you've got a presentation tomorrow, don't you? you want to talk something like that? I have a, a live planetarium show at noon, and uh, we, then at half past one, we have the uh, sunspot and weather committee. Yeah. So, we'll be sure to, in our future podcasts, we'll be sure to give our review of the Christian Museum and particularly the sunspotting program if the weather permits. So, you got any final words for us? Come see us. Uh, we always like people to come visit the museum. And a lot of people do, too. So, anyway, you got anything to say? No, I'm, I'm still catching up on what uh, the doctor said. Keep it up. <laughs> so, anyway, um, be sure to check out Creation Museum. But while you're at it, be sure to check out creationstarmyout.com. We got some awesome articles coming out. I actually went to the museum in particular because I was running out of ideas. So I'll go to the museum and I'll get some more ideas for articles and keep Jake Goburns happy. <laughs> so, that's what we're going to do and I got some more stuff to review. Wow, I'm rhyming. So till next time, take it easy. We are out. <laughs>